It's all the time at the White House. We just change, <laughs> change things to suit our needs. Wow. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's it's really wonderful to be here. I am I am Karen DeSalvo, and I'm the acting assistant secretary for health. And I have the um, the great joy of being able to be a leader in our delivery system reform work in the Department of Health and Human Services. So you heard about some of that work earlier that we're doing to make the care system more person-centered and really meet meet people where they are um, and, and be able to coordinate care better. Um, my office actually uh, has a, a hand in a lot of the, the recommendations around prevention for nutritional and physical fitness. So um, we put out the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is how we decide what kids are going to eat in school and what uh, Meals on Wheels programs um, have, have uh, for feeding. We do the physical activity guidelines to make recommendations for Americans about, about uh, what's the science say about how much we should exercise. And we measure that through Healthy People 2020. We're just starting Healthy People 2030 already. And then we get to do really fun work with communities like Let's Move Cities, Towns, and Counties. Uh, where we get to work directly with communities to encourage them to, to take up a healthier healthier lifestyle work. Uh, all that is is wonderful policy work, but um, at the by, but my real day job is that I'm a doctor, and I'm an internist, which means that um, diabetes is the core of very much of what I did and do uh, in taking care of patients. It's something that um, I haven't been in Louisiana practicing medicine, where we have really high rates of, of diabetes. I have uh, unfortunately had a lot of experience with and um, uh, had the chance to go across the uh, journeys of several years with my patients as they have learned to self-manage and learned about their disease and, and had the um, sort of the, the, as was said before, the every day, 24 hours a day, um, uh, every day of the year challenge of, of uh, staying healthy, being healthy, um, and, and sort of uh, working through the science and making sure that we, that we keep up with that for them. And I have diabetes in my family, as I bet everybody in this country does, just because of the, of the rates of disease. So um, this isn't just about policy, I think, for most of us. It's personal. Um, it's really important uh, for me as a doctor that we're doing the kind of science that's happening um, to see that we can make uh, quality of life better. Uh, but also to see that that um, we're really thinking through and listening to what um, patients and families need from us in the healthcare system and in the scientific community and in the policy world that can really help them have a better quality of life, better health, prevent diabetes in the first place. So I'm really looking forward to this panel um, and hearing from them directly uh, about what ways that, that diabetes has impacted either their lives individually or the lives of their family members. Um, and, and, and their community and hearing what we could be doing to help uh, really, really make the system work better for, for people with diabetes, to help prevent diabetes for the family members. So with that, um, I'm going to kind of turn it over uh, generally to the, to the panel. And I thought I might start, and I'll start with you, Sam, um, about uh, sort of how diabetes has touched your life um, and, and to share with this group what, 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 the, what, you, what you believe is sort of the most important things that people ought to know personally and about family members. Um, with respect to diabetes? Definitely. Well, uh, my diabetes story is, uh, you know, there's some good and some bad, right? So diabetes is actually how I got a chance to meet my wife. Uh, my, let, me, let me explain. Uh, <laughs> so my grandmother lives in Nigeria. My parents are from Nigeria. And so she developed type 2 diabetes when she was in her 80s. And she, she needed someone to take care of her. And so uh, my parents called some friends who were living over in Nigeria and found a young girl who was uh, willing and able to move from the city she was living in to the village to take care of my grandma with diabetes. And uh, I would go back, my family does medical mission trips to Nigeria, I'd go back every summer and I'd see this young girl taking care of my grandmother, and I was a young man at the time, and uh, you know, things happen. <laughs> and fast forward and uh, we're married now. And, uh, and so, but so that's, that's a little bit of my diabetes story. Well, moving on to part two of that story, uh, my wife now, we have a 15-month-old son, but during that pregnancy, mm -hmm. my wife developed gestational diabetes. And so as I as got a chance to become more of an advocate for diabetes and learn about um, what's going on with diabetes, I experienced it firsthand. We changed our diet. We changed our exercise. Uh, it was, it's not a, you know, we talked about it being 24-7, 365. It's a, it's a family deal. It's not just a single person issue. It's a family issue. And so our lifestyle changed, and now we know that our son is now predisposed, but we're doing the things to help prevent or delay diabetes in our family. And so I look at some of the programs I'm involved in with the NFL. I play with the Chicago Bears. I'm a part of the NFL Fuel Up to Play 60 program. We talk a lot about 
uh, eating healthy and exercising, fueling up, right, eating the right things and playing 60 minutes a day. And so much of what we talk about with the, with the Fuel Up to Play 60 program to kids, it's so relevant to diabetes prevention and diabetes delay. And so I look at um, being an advocate for the ADA as, far to, as a part of Team Tackle, along with 33 other NFL players here. It's such an honor to be able to, to say that I'm standing here with the American Diabetes Association and saying, hey, there are some easy things we can do as far as, uh, and as an NFL player being a mouthpiece uh, for people who are living with diabetes, who have experienced diabetes. You know, and, and so uh, I'm honored to be here, honored to be a part of this panel. Uh, there are so many experts here, so I'm honored just to, to even be uh, in you all's presence. So thank you. Well, you're an expert also. Yeah. Teach, teach good habits early and they stick longer. Um, so, so Anastasia, why don't you tell us about your connection with diabetes? Um, yeah, so our daughter Cassidy was 16 months old when she was um, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and that was 14 years ago. And um, there was no family history um, of any type of diabetes. Um, and so we were entirely caught off guard um, by her diagnosis um, and really had no idea what to expect. We spent a couple of nights in the ICU, which were frightening. And it really wasn't until years later that I realized um, how close we had come to losing her when we were there. Uh, we moved out onto the hospital floor, and that's when we were taught how to check her blood glucose and how to give insulin injections and how to count carbohydrates um, and all the things that we needed to do to keep her safe. Um, and I think what I learned quickly back in 2002 is that the diabetes is a family disease and um, that it has to become a way of life if you're going to manage it well. And it's all day and every day. And uh, when Cassidy uh, heard I was coming to the White House, which I still really can't wrap my head around, I'll be honest, um, she said, well, I'll give you a quote from a president about how I feel about diabetes. And this is a quote from Lyndon Johnson. And he was talking about hailstorms on Texas highways. And he said, I can't outrun it, I can't get out from under it, and I can't make it go away. And so I think that I carry that with me when I think about her day-to-day -day, um, with diabetes. A couple more points. In 2005, um, our son was born Jackson. And uh, he is another redhead, so I have two. And um, at that time, as Dr. Rogers said, scientists had unraveled the genetics behind type 1 diabetes, some very specific genes. Um, but they really didn't understand what that environmental trigger was. And, um, they asked if Jackson could be screened for the TEDI study, the Environmental Determinants of Diabetes in the Young. And I said, well, there's no history of diabetes in my family, so go ahead. Um, I, I thought we were safe. And um, I remember when Dr. Schatz called me, he said, why don't you sit down, because Jackson's odds are one in four. And so he's been one of those kids for 11 years donating biosamples to the Teddy study. And I will say some are easier to collect than others. Um, <laughs> haven't been a big fan of the stool sample, Dr. Rogers, but we're getting there. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I digress. I'll just <laughs> Last thing I'll say is that in 2006, when I was driving Cass to school, um, we were going to do a walk around raising money for diabetes research. And I was trying to explain to her why that was so important, and she said, well, Mom, what are you doing to cure diabetes? And um, I think when your child is diagnosed with a chronic disease, um, and I think there are people in this room that can identify, you feel pretty helpless. Uh, and so what I did is I went back to school, and I became a nurse, and then a nurse practitioner, and then a PhD, and I just kept going, because um, I figured it would give me some agency to really strike back against diabetes. So I am grateful to the American Diabetes Association that gave me a voice to talk about diabetes here in the nation's capital, and to the NIH for doing the research they do, and all the other associated organizations for making that possible, and to Cassidy for asking that question, so the work I do each day is meaningful. It's a great story. Thank you for bringing her voice directly to you with the quote. I appreciate that. Yes. Gina, will you share with us your connection with diabetes? Yes, um, and I'm very grateful to be here as well. And it's very touching, you know, the people that you meet over the years um, living with diabetes. I was uh, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, 36 years ago. And I was diagnosed in October, two weeks before Halloween which there's never a good time to be diagnosed, but being diagnosed right before Halloween just really wasn't, Easter might have been the, the second worst time of year, I'm not quite sure. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because we remember different things and 
research has brought us so far. When I was first diagnosed, we didn't even have meters to, to check our blood sugar. I had a urine chemistry test that, you know, you had to put so many drops of urine in a clinitest tablet, and you had to wait like an eternity for it to turn a color, and it didn't even tell you how you were right then at the moment. That's how you were a little while ago. So the fact that research has come so far has really changed the course of my life. But what's interesting is at 10 years old, I remember sitting in the pediatrician's office with my mom, and I remember the pediatrician talking to my mom, telling her, you know, she will never be able to have children. It's too dangerous. She'll probably die. Life will be a lot shorter. You know, don't make big plans. And all I could think about was, hello, I'm like sitting right here and I can hear you. Um, I remember that like it was yesterday, and that was 36 years ago. Um, so I don't, I think a lot of that kind of changed my, my thoughts on, I'm, you know, I don't want to be that statistic. And, you know, as the years went on and technology has really, research has really brought us better insulins and has really bought us all of those wonderful things that we talked about, like continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps. But it's still here and it's still hard and it's still cumbersome and it's the hardest job I have ever had and it's not a job. Um, but it's really changed how I view things. And in my professional role as a nurse, I um, have a background in emergency department nursing, and I also am the president and CEO of a charitable clinic. And health disparities is a issue that's very near and dear to my heart. And growing up, my health and my success in living with diabetes has greatly been affected by my ability to have access to affordable insurance, to have the tools, to be able to afford the tools that I need to check my blood sugar, and to be able to afford my medication, which for people who are taking insulin, insulin can cost people hundreds of thousands of dollars per month. So if you don't have the ability and the resources to take care of yourself, and you don't have the education on how to self-manage, it's very, very, very challenging. So working in the emergency department and, and working at a charitable clinic, I see the other side of the fence in terms of what happens when people don't have access to the things that they, the things that they need to stay healthy. And it's devastating. And it's costly um, for both the person, but also for the United States and for our health systems and everything. And I'll tell you, though, it's... There, there is a lot, there's a ton of hope. There's a ton of great things that have happened as a result of the Affordable Care Act being passed and people having more access to insurance and be, having more access to being able to afford what they need. There's still a long way to go with a lot of pieces, um, but I'm very, my, my big thing was always, I will never lose hope, and I do pray, and I hope every day that that cure will be found. And it's very exciting, the artificial pancreas and getting closer. And then um, three years ago, when my sister was 38 years old, she was diagnosed with type 1. And it's, it hurt. It was not what, you know, we had always hope that, you know, you, you're getting older, everything will be fine, and, and there's no guarantee. So we're very, very thankful. I am very, very thankful for where research has gotten me in my life and very excited to the hope for the future and um, thankful to be here. It's a powerful story. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so Rashad Jennings is going to share with us his story at the connection of diabetes. Right. All right. Um, well, first, I'm so humbled to be here. I can't imagine, like I never thought I'd be sitting in the White House having a conversation. So first, I'm so humbled to be here, uh, honestly. Um, my name is Rashad Jennings. I try not to hold up too much of your time, but I'm from a little town called Forest, Virginia. And I like to tell people that it is self-explanatory. I grew up a country kid, understanding animals before I understood people. I'm still trying to figure out people, so <laughs> if you figure it out before I do, y'all let me know. Um, but how I, I am associated um, and affiliated with diabetes is my father. He has diabetes. Um, I grew up this little short, overweight, chubby kid with glasses and asthma. I had a .6 GPA average at one point in time. I was the fifth string running back, um, riding the bench, saying that I wanted to play in the NFL. And obviously I had to overcome a lot of adversity to get here. <laughs> um, 
But and 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 how how doing that is kind of is an ironic story um, because it's it's really between me and my dad. I had a I had a really heartfelt conversation one day with my father. Um, growing up, he used to drink a lot. He used to smoke cigarettes a lot. Uh, he never did anything crazy. He just would kind of mellow out and, and and disappear from the family. And I remember going in his room one day, and he was drinking, and um, I, I asked him. This is that little short, overweight kid. I said, Dad, can you stop drinking to be there for me? And um, he took a sip of his drink. He looked at me, and he said, Rashad, what you want to do when you get older? I said, I want to play running back in the NFL. He took another sip of his drink. He said, Rashad, do you think you'll be able to make it to the NFL without smoking or drinking yourself? And I looked at him, and I said, just to prove you wrong, I'm never going to do it. And I'm definitely appreciative of that challenge because I can say I'm 31 years old. I've never drank or smoked a day in my life. Um, and because of that, because my father watched his little knucklehead son prove him wrong, that caused him to put down alcohol and cigarettes himself. Um, Fast forward and through high school, getting the opportunity to uh, get, a, get a full scholarship to Pittsburgh University, I got a phone call when I was at Pitt by my mother, letting me know that my dad was going to have to get his legs amputated. And, you know, all the, again, going back to all the work that I had to do, dedicate, transfer schools, repeat, take nine homeschool classes, take nine summer school classes on top of the academics that I had just to get my GPA where it needed to be with the SATs. Took a lot of work to actually get to a position to go to a big time university. When I got that phone call, the only thing I could think about was family. Like Sam said, it, if one individual is dealing with it, we all are. Um, and that's why we all are in this room. And so I went to my coach and said, look, I, I need to transfer because I got to go home and be there for my family. Family is all I know and have for 19 years. At that time, I was 19 years old, and I wanted to go home. So I transferred to Liberty University because it's 10 minutes from my house. Um, I dedicated and worked my tail off every single day for the things that I love and wanted to do. And I quickly learned out that if you do the right things, the world is round. Eventually, it'll come back to you. And you know, as a professional athlete, to watch uh, my father a man that I always looked up at, big, burly, strong, dependent man who, who, who had to lose his legs and a way of living in a lifestyle because of diabetes. And I watched my mother give her whole entire life to support this man. I've, I've, my brothers, everybody has been affected just because of one person. Um, and as an athlete, there's nothing special about me. You know, I think I could say for both of us, we're just in special positions. So anytime we get to unmask ourselves and be a magnifying glass towards things that are important and, and magnify you all, um, because y'all are the true heroes working behind the scenes, we're playing a game. And so we want to come support, um, raise the money necessary, needed for this organization, um, this cause, because it is pivotal to our communities. It affects us daily. Um, and I want to I want to help fight for that cause. So um, I'm here. I'm, I'm glad to answer questions. But again, I'm so humbled uh, to have this opportunity to speak at the White House. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Aaron, share with us your story about connection with diabetes. Yeah, just once again, thank you guys for having us here. It's been an honor, been a blast to uh, being in the White House, my first time here in Washington, so it's kind of crazy first time. You get to go to the White House and Capitol building, all that good stuff. So it's been been a good time, and, and I've learned a lot. Um, and like a lot of you, I've been affected my family. Uh, growing up, I was very privileged. My grandparents lived pretty much right across the street from us, so I was going back and forth between my house. We'd go over and hang out with Grandma and Grandpa because they would give us cookies all the time um, and just make sure my parents didn't know that. Uh, so we're always there hanging out and the older I got, the older my grandmother got, I started to see it and recognize it a little bit more. 
Uh, there'd be times we'd be in the yard playing and throwing the ball around or doing this and that, and, and she'd have to take a break um, because she would lose feeling in her feet and, um, or they would hurt. She'd have to sit down, and there'd be days where she just sat down and watched us the entire day because she just couldn't move. Um, so it'd be like, come on, Grandma. And I really, I mean, I was young. I had no idea. She, oh, you guys got it. Don't worry about it. Uh, and then as it started to get worse and worse and worse, um, she started having vision problems. So she, there'd be all the grandchildren in the yard, and, and she'd be there sitting smiling, but she couldn't tell who was who. It'd just be blurs, or someday she couldn't see us at all. So she's trying to be there, enjoy her grandchildren, go to our games, and, and be with us. But we know she was in pain, and uh, we knew she was missing out. Um, so grandma's big, and then find out, so my dad, is, there's four kids in the family. My dad, uh, two sisters, and, and his brother. Um, three of them all have type 2 diabetes. Uh, my dad is the only one, uh, and, and of all the siblings, that does not have diabetes. My mom likes to take the credit for that. She said when they got married 30 years ago, she started teaching them how to eat properly. So <laughs> started, eat, started cooking clean and, and uh, changing up a little bit. And I think that's huge. And, and I, when I was asked to come here, I actually called my aunt, both my aunts are nurses, uh, just to get a little bit of background uh, about what they go through, about what my grandmother went through, just because I was so young uh, when she was going through it. And, and she did say a lot of it was the way they were eating, and a lot of things were the way my grandmother cooked, and this and that, and not exercising enough for not getting out and about um, really affected her, affected them, and now they're dealing with type 2 diabetes as well. And I think as NFL players, and, and Sam was talking about it, um, you know, there's so many great programs that we're involved in, whether it's Play 60 or each team has various things where they're out in the community work at the YMCA and, and other great stuff um, that we, I think, do a great job. The NFL does a great job of really getting us involved in the community and teaching these kids that, yeah, it's fun and it may be easy to sit in front of a TV all day and play video games and eat potato chips. And that's what my, everyone is, does nowadays. But uh, to, to teach these healthy habits as, as uh young kids to eat properly, to eat your fruits and vegetables, to listen to your parents, to get outside and play for 60 minutes a day, that uh, it's not only good for you now, but it's something that is going to you know, help you down the line with preventing not only diabetes, but other, other diseases that uh, come about. So I think as us, it's our, it's our goal, it's our mission, it's, and it's fun uh, to get out there, to have fun, to teach these kids and to be great advocates for for the NFL and for you know uh, foundations like the ADA. So once again, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to do my part to try to help the kids um, get out, have some fun, eat healthy, and, and do the right thing. I think that's great. Robin, will you, will you bring it home and tell us about your connection to diabetes? I will, thanks. Yes, I will. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. As the 2016 chair of the National Board of the American Diabetes Association, I see diabetes in a lot of different ways, and I'll just set the stage before I share my personal story. 30 million Americans with diabetes, almost 10% of the population, and 85 plus million at risk with prediabetes. Everyone knows someone with diabetes. In this room, that's natural, but outside of this room, I talk to people every day and they say, I don't know anybody with diabetes, and I say, open your eyes you'd be surprised. Just pay attention to your surroundings. Everyone knows someone with diabetes, even though they think they don't. Um, but I, I am a member of the Cherokee Nation. My maternal mother's uh, Indian name is Corntassel. My grandfather's name is Robert Corntassel. My great-great-grandfather made uh, six trips on the Trail of Tears as a blacksmith. His wife and children all died on the first uh, first trip, and fortunately he remarried later and had nine children, six of whom had offspring, one of which was my great-grandfather, Johnson Corntassel. And American Indians and Native Alaskans are at highest risk of, of adult diagnosed diabetes at almost 15.9 percent, higher than any other racial or ethnic group. So I'm at risk for diabetes, but I also watch diabetes in my family on the Native American side. My mother has diabetes, my aunt has diabetes, my grandfather died of diabetes. My uncle uh, died a horrible death from diabetes. He was a truck driver who happened to get fired from his job because he had diabetes. And as the provider of his family, you can imagine how that impacted him. 
He lost his dignity, his sense of self-worth. He lost his family. And ultimately, he lost his life because he had multiple amputations, like um, Rashad's father, and ultimately it killed him. And this was a guy who was athletic, who was the life of the party, who was um, every sense of the way a wonderful human being and lost his life because of diabetes. Gave me my very first set of golf clubs. He was a great guy. But um, we need to pay attention to this disease because it is devastating in uh, so many ways, not only to my, uh, my family, but to all of the families that are up here. And we all share our connection in our, our personal stories with diabetes, so thank you. All right, I have about 425 questions to ask, to ask everyone. But um, the, the great news is, is that you all have been shaping your stories, have sort of touched on, on a few key issues. And I think I might, what I might like to do is throw back to this panel, since we are in Washington, um, and, and you are in the White House. And uh, I've got some people from NIH in the audience and some policymakers to tell us, uh, this group generally, but if you wanted the community to know something about diabetes, things that they should know or should do, or policymakers uh, about what we should be doing, where we should focus um, energy to see that we can give people a, fu a future that's more hopeful even than where we've been in the last few years. Do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you know, if, if there were a message I would tell, um, you would say my fans, right, people who watch the NFL or, or, or people who admire um, any professional athlete uh, about diabetes, I would tell them that diabetes affects everyone. And Robin mentioned it, but it affects everyone. Whether you know it or not, it affects everyone. Uh, you, look, you look at the stat, by 2050, if, if we don't do something now, one in three people will have diabetes. So it affects everyone, and it will affect everyone if nothing's, not, if anything, if nothing's done. And so uh, one, one area I look at a lot is, is prevention. I look at, you know, we talk about if you lose 7% of your, of your body weight, that's one way to prevent eating healthy, exercising. Uh, it's easy as an athlete to, to tell people to exercise and to go and to run around and uh, even to tell kids, hey, if you want to make it to the NFL, you can just play 60 minutes a day, but it's more than that, right? You t look at adults who develop type 1 diabetes or even type 2 diabetes. You talk about just walking, running, jogging. Um, riding your bike, changing your lifestyle, little things can make a big impact and make a big difference. And if there's something I would tell policymakers, I would say that um, we're here to be your mouthpiece. As simple as that, we're here to be your mouthpiece. We're, there, there's a reason why you have a player from every single NFL team here today at the White House on behalf of the, uh, the ADA. We're here to be your mouthpiece. We care. We're affected by it. Everyone's affected by it. And so if there's one message I would tell to policymakers to um, NFL fans to uh, my fans is that we're all affected, so let's do something about it and stop diabetes. Right. Yeah. You're next. That's a big question. So I'll turn on my mic. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping you might say something in, this, in the research area since you've had a lot of experience in that space. Yeah, I think um, this really gives me an opportunity to express how glad I am that long before Cassidy was born and long before she was diagnosed with diabetes, that diabetes research was a priority here in Washington, that it was funded and that it happened. Because without that, I, I can tell you, well, with that, I can tell you that her life has been immeasurably better because of the research that has been conducted with support from policymakers, with support uh, from organizations working in collaboration. Um, a simple example uh, about the time she was diagnosed was that uh, about a week after she turned two years old, she got an insulin pump. And um, we still had to check her blood glucose frequently by finger stick. But I will tell you that the insulin pump allowed us for the first time at a touch of a button to give her insulin. And that was so much better than giving six injections a day to a two-year-old. It was an overwhelming change. It felt like we, had, we got our child back, I'll be honest. And it even, that pump, for whatever reason, came with this little remote control. So if she, uh, it did, and if she strayed over to the cupcake table, like at a birthday party, we could actually remote in the insulin from across the room. It was, yeah, it was awesome. I think there's no more remotes, but, 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 
when I, when I think of that extraordinary change for us, and then I think of what we heard about today, about the artificial pancreas system that would combine a continuous glucose monitor with an insulin pump and a mathematical algorithm that would take diabetes off the table for her and for the millions of other people who are doing intensive management. I'm glad the DCCT brought us intensive management because we know we can prevent complications. But I'm also so excited about the possibility of that technology and making it affordable for people, people to use. And then I will say on behalf of, of my son, and of, um, so that's for my daughter and all the patients that I see in clinic and all the people that I know, the families I know. For my son, what do we want? We want prevention. So if we get a technological fix, we still want a cure. Because I never want any member of my family or anybody else's family to sit in a doctor's office and hear a diagnosis of diabetes. And so ultimately, we need to continue to fund that research that moves us closer to ultimately preventing and curing the disease. So that's it. <coughs> Gina, could I ask you to talk about it in the, in the realm of costs for, for patients and things that you think that we ought to be knowing about um, living with diabetes and mm -hmm. things? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I didn't share when I was telling my story that I'm going to throw in really quickly is when my doctor did tell my mother that I would never be able to have children, I do have two wonderfully healthy, beautiful teenagers that I'm very proud of. And cost is, cost is always an issue. We have, as, as the chair of the National Di American Diabetes Association's National Advocacy Committee, but also as a nurse, you know, we see and we hear it over and over and over that people just cannot afford, they can't afford, they can't afford. And a lot has really happened, a lot that has happened that's been very positive since the Affordable Care Act has passed and the expansion of Medicaid in the states that have passed. And that ability for people to access care that they can afford that's quality care instead of just episodic care where they keep going to the emergency department is a huge cost saver. Um, in, my, in my emergency department background, you know, people who don't have insurance, that's where they go. And it's not cost effective. It's incredibly expensive. And there's no primary care in an emergency department. So nothing is really being treated or managed. So the fact that now people have more access, whether it's through marketplace plans or whether it's, for, or whether it's through the expansion of Medicaid, I think the other important piece is, is that we do need to continue to collaborate to make sure that people who are now insured, they understand how to use that insurance because just because you have a card doesn't mean you understand the confusing everything that goes along with, with insurance and the coverage and the costs. Um, and I think the other piece, too, is, is that there are still barriers there. There are still a lot of people who do not have insurance. They either can meet the exemptions and you know for, for not having coverage through the marketplace plans, or they're churning between not having insurance and having Medicaid or churning between Medicaid and marketplace plans. So we need to knock those barriers down so people do have access to everything that they need, whether it's medications, whether it's testing supplies, and especially education, which we're getting better at getting that incorporated into for people to live healthy and to, to be productive and have healthy lives. That's excellent. Thank you. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad that you reminded us about uh, those, the, t you know, the 10 percent of our country that's still uninsured, and that turns out in some communities to be the most vulnerable. And, and so it's important for us not to lose sight of it. I know you have something that you want to say, Rashad, but I hope that in your remarks, you will touch back on the powerful part of your story that touched me about your self-empowerment, self, um, that you are very driven internally and very, therefore, probably um, w somebody who is really able to, I'm um, going to say, take the ball. Can I say that? <laughs> and, and run with it? That's a terrible thing that I just did. Uh, I did it. Uh, because, because, you know, as a doc, I, I can prescribe all the best things or do the best education, but at some point I, I need to make sure that the person, that my, that my patient is going to be able to partner. So I just love your advice about how to help uh, really uh, the patient become more empowered and families to get more educated and empowered in the way that you've been as a person and the way you, I hope that you've you know, manifested for your family. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Um, so one, one thing that I've been doing, um, now, I'm proud to say I'm an NFL player rep in the league, and one of the things and blessings being in New York is that I'm in New York. <laughs> so the NFL headquarters is in New York, 
and so I've taken several different meetings um, at the headquarters. I've sat down with Roger Goodell and his team, and currently we're having these conversations that breast cancer awareness, <clears throat> the month of October, rocks pink. We're out on the football field. We're wearing pink. I've been knocking on the doors about wearing red in November um, as a... Because it's so, it's, it's, it's so many, it's so many, it's so many men um, that, that plays in the NFL and there's so many women that work around the organizations that actually deal with diabetes either directly or indirectly. So that's something that I've been fighting for. Um, as to touch um, on a little bit of what you were saying, you do have to take ownership and responsibility at some point. I mean, you can, you can be granted all the information you want, but knowledge is only powerful when you apply it. Um, and, and one thing to touch on an example, and kind of it would go back to the policy, I give myself, I, I did, I had a .6 GPA average, but I'm an audited DAC. I love to learn. I'm a free thinker. I'm a big dork and nerd. So check this out. Every, every day I give myself 15 minutes a day to do nothing but sit down, shut up, and think, literally. So one day I was at the house, <laughs> and I got a remote in my hand. And I'm changing the channel, just nonchalant. And as I'm changing the channel, I notice that every time I press the button to change the channel, it would change the channel at the same speed every single time. Change the channel, hit the button, change the channel, hit the button and change the channel at the same speed every time. So I started thinking about it. No matter if this battery is full or it's on its last limb, it's going to change that channel at the same speed. Same thing with a lot that goes on in our life, our spiritual life, mental life, our health life. Because we wake up every day and we walk. We take one step. We think we're fine. But you never know when you're on that last limb. How often do you take time to check the battery? Just because you're changing the channel at the same time, you're having no warnings. And it goes back to prevention. And so one of the things I think back to life, beginning to end, as a kid to an adult, how much did I not pay attention to my battery? And if I could change one policy, it would go back to the kids, the education system, and touching inside the cafeteria and changing the food. Um, because I, I've, I'm a gluten and casein free eater. I've been that way, at, I don't have celiac. I've been that way by choice for the last 10 years. I do everything I possibly can to take care of my body. I do everything organically. I sleep in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Um, I do whatever I possibly can. And, you know, again, going back to this awesome responsibility, I feel like God has just given me a platform. God has just put me in positions and taken me different places to get educated, to only regurgitate and, and give this back. Um, and so through my foundation, I spend numerous amounts of time just going to different communities, going to different high schools, going to different middle schools, going to different um, stations and just speaking about the truth of education, the truth of our, our health industry, um, and reminding people that it's an industry, um, not, a, not a service. Industries are made to make money. So to actually change that industry and educate the kids, and it starts with us, but going back to the ownership, if you can't look in the mirror um, and expect and demand more of yourself, then don't even think about doing it to somebody else. All right, Aaron's like, what's she going to ask me? <laughs> uh, going on the same theme of what you'd want us to know, want the community to know, and, and, and since you talked about um, prevention and, and that really being important to get those habits early, if there's anything in that space you wanted to let us know how we might make that easier. Uh, what I loved earlier from the earlier panels was talking about just the whole prevention thing, but just kids, young kids going back to school, uh, not only kids, but the parents. Uh, going back to my story, the way my grandmother cooked, and it's just the only way that my aunt, uncle, and, and dad knew what was good. I mean, is what, you know, they were served in the cafeteria. This is what was made at home. Uh, they had no knowledge that what they were putting in their body would later on in their 30s and 40s affect them, and then now they're having to take insulin shots and, and dealing with all this. So not only education with the kids, which I think is key, of, of getting in there, uh, like we discussed, and, and changing up the food that our kids eat, and not every meal. I remember when I was little, it was 
everyone every day would have pizza. You know, our parents would give us money, and we'd go out there and have pizza for lunch every day and, and chips and all this bad stuff. And, and that's what they serve. And if you give the kids the option of having pizza or a piece of chicken, they're going to pick pizza. So, I mean, at that age, they really don't know. They just know what tastes good. So by, by teaching them what eating certain food does to your body, how it benefits you, not only in the classroom, but if you're performing, whether it's sports, whether it's in the choir, or anything like that, the way you feel your body uh, affects you uh, now and then in the future. So teaching them a little bit about nutrition, then also teaching the parents, finding a way to uh, reach them, uh, whether it's bringing them in or sending stuff home to the parents saying, hey, we're trying a whole new program for just eating right, and this is some benefits that we're doing in school, and we would like to see you incorporate in your household, um, going to buy healthier groceries, healthier snacks. So I think prevention's key. I think uh, teaching our young kids and then also teaching their parents uh, so that only it's just not happening just in the schools, but it's happening uh, when they come home. You can also work on making chicken taste better. Yeah, you that too. <laughs> All right, Robin. Um, uh, same same general question about about policy, but I do hope you'll talk about um, impact on on some populations. You, you talk, and that would be really terrific to give us some guidance there. Okay. Well, first, I think I we need to recognize the w the wonderful work that's been done to date in terms of policy. Mm. So NIDDK, the work that CDC is doing, the diabetes prevention program. So we're not starting from scratch. So now what we need to do is be improving those. Uh, obviously, we would like to see more funding from that standpoint on all three of those programs, so improving that. But also, uh, there's a special diabetes program, um, was mentioned, but there's one for Indians uh, as well that resides in the Indian Health Service. And currently, it's funded at $150 million a year. This has started in 1997 and comes up periodically for review. It currently expires. Um, in uh, 2017. And so one of the things that we would like from a policy perspective is to make that funding permanent. And we would advocate for permanent funding of that. It's being proposed in the budget, thank you, uh, for the, to maintain $150 million. But, but we think a lot of efforts are wasted by, by always coming back to the table and trying to get that funding and advocate for that funding. Mm -hmm. Making that permanent would allow, again, a lot of work to be done on diabetes that, that needs to be done without worrying about the funding for that. So that would be one of the primary things that we would argue in addition to, um, uh, to again, supporting the programs that exist. I would add one, one other thing. Um, you know, I see in my day job, I see diabetes from the payer perspective. I see it on the commercial side. I run a, a medicated coordinated care organization in rural part of Oregon that operates under a global budget, as uh, I think the doctor Racine talked about. And that gives us a lot of freedom to do things uh, differently in terms of diabetes. And we see diabetes. And what I would say is Medicaid expansion hasn't occurred across the country. It needs to occur across the country because there's a lot of people, you know, 10 percent of the uninsured, some of those people would come in under the Medicaid expansion. There's another way to address that through Medicaid expansion. But we need to focus on, I, I think, on those core elements uh, uh, from a public policy standpoint. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to, I want to thank this panel. It's incredibly uh, moving stories across the board, great ideas. I wrote down a lot of great, great um, ideas, but also quotes. So I'll be stealing those from you all um, um, readily and, and using them. And we look forward to continuing to partner with you all. We really, really, really appreciate it. Can we get a round of applause for the panel?